Good everyone. How are you all doing today? Good. Thank you all for being here for What Matters to Me and Why. Uh, thanks for your patience. We're all ready to go now. Uh, please grab some lunch if you haven't already. Um, and there are some seats up here in the front. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? Good? Great. So how many people are here for the first time today? Wonderful. Well, welcome to the series. I hope this won't be the last time you attend. We uh, do What Matters to Me and Why every month. The first Wednesday of every month at noon, we serve a free lunch. Uh, next month, we have Scott Soames, who's the chair of the School of Philosophy, and then Donna Elliott, who runs Student Affairs and is a professor of clinical pediatrics at um, Keck. She'll be here in December. And I also want to invite all of you to our special screening on October 20th of the film Poetics of Fragility. It'll be at the uh, School of Cinematic Arts, Theater 108 at 7 p.m., um, and it's open to the public. For those of you who are here for the first time, um, what Matters to Me and Why is a national conversation that happens at many schools, that's been happening at many schools for at least 20 years. We're in our 16th year here at USC, and what makes our series so different is that, first of all, we do it every month, not every semester. And second of all, our speakers are nominated and chosen by students. And oftentimes, our speakers are introduced by students. Almost always, they're introduced by students. And that's because students who have professors as mentors uh, can offer some insight into um, their relationship in a way that transcends a traditional bio. But today, I'm exercising my prerogative as the hopes of what matters to me why. I'm going off script, and I... Um, I'm gonna introduce the speaker today, um, and that's because the speaker has been a mentor for me too. So I think it is altogether appropriate uh, in some respects that I am uh, in many ways a student of our speaker today, and so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to introduce him. I got to USC when um, 2008, and uh, when I got here I thought I could be the cool, hip dean of color on campus, and then I realized that job was already filled by uh, Ernie Wilson, um, so I can be a stunt double maybe. but. Um, um, I'm really grateful to him for being here today because this year we celebrate uh, 10 years of his historic leadership of the Annenberg School. And um, he has announced that next year he'll be returning back to the classroom. So I hope he gets to do a victory lap this year because it really has been an extraordinary run. When we look back on Dean Wilson's time at the Annenberg School, you know, we can see incredible an incredible legacy. We can see a stunning new building. Uh, if any of you are Annenberg students, it's really a world-class facility. Les Moonves told Ernie that uh, they don't even have a newsroom that sophisticated at CBS News. Uh, so our students here really um, are so, so lucky. Uh, he's developed all sorts of new and exciting majors and minors, new formats, initiatives, and opportunities for students to learn and become practitioners of media and communication. He's brought on incredible new scholars and leaders at the Annenberg School. He has a world-class faculty who he supports there every day, including Professor Josh Kuhn, who just won the MacArthur Genius Grant two weeks ago. Uh, he's really positioned Annenberg as a global leader in communication and journalism, and his impact is felt around the world in terms of uh, where students come from and where they end up going. And uh, in the mark of uh, the true metric for a dean's success, he's raised over two, almost 200 million in the last 20, uh, 10 years. Uh, really, in, I think most of it in the last five years, I don't think any um, dean of any uh, journalism school has ever done that. But for me, his real legacy is actually um, something else. It's an idea that he's pioneering called the third space. And he'll talk a little bit about that today, but the third space involves cultural competency, emotional intelligence, empathy, 360 degree thinking. And that's the kind of approach he is looking to train his students in. I feel like we study who we are, we study what we know, and I think Ernie's interest in the third space is because he is the third space. Uh, he does embody all those qualities that he promotes through a third space approach. That's why he's been such a successful dean and scholar. That's why he's advised the governments of both President Barack Obama and President Nelson Mandela. That's why he was the first African-American leader of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That's why he hung out with Fela Kuti at the shrine in Nigeria in the 1970s. That's why he was recently chosen to give the prestigious W.E. Du Bois lectures at Harvard University. That's why he's such a beloved professor and mentor, partner and friend, husband and father, because he is the third space. And his life and his work is an inspiring example for all of us to think about how we cultivate a third space in our own life. So I'm extremely grateful to him for joining us. Um, a dean's life is ex very busy. Uh, I know he spent a lot of time thinking deeply about the question today. So please join me in welcoming my friend and yours, the dean of the Annenberg School uh, and the Walter Annenberg Chair in Communication and Journalism at the University of Southern California, Dr. Ernest Wilson. Good 
afternoon, everyone. Look, I'm the dean of a communication school, so we got to commute. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, that's a good start. That's a good start. Uh, I want to thank my dear friend, uh, Dean Varun Sony, for the generous introduction. I have to tell you a little story. Um, right soon after he started, um, and we had a couple of conversations, and we kind of, you know, I think hit it off well with one another. And it was cemented when he called up and said, hey, Ernie, um, I think uh, I have a proposal, an idea for you. Say, why don't we go out with our wives? Because Charday is playing in town, and John Legend is going to be the first act. And I said, anybody who really likes Charday and anybody who likes John Legend is my kind of guy. So I'm going to repay the, uh, the compliment. He's prob he really is the coolest dean. I mean, didn't rock band or something like that, PhD, I mean, like all this, I mean, all this amazing stuff. Uh, so I think he's probably really the third space guy. Um, so how do we know, so here's the question I want to ask. How do we know what matters to us? I'm going to try to answer that, but I hope the questions that I pose and share with you will be as interesting, provocative than the answers that I provide in my own case. So one easy way to answer this question is by resorting to linear, logical thinking. Sit at a table, stare at the ceiling, and write a list. That's the way we usually do stuff, right? We think about it. And that's the way I began. And when I looked at some of the earlier presentations here, I think that also uh, pertains to the previous uh, speakers. Uh, but aren't there other ways of knowing about ourselves? Can't we deduce what matters by observing the choices that people make in what they actually do, in what they read, and especially in this group on a university campus, what they might write? So it's not just thinking. It's doing. It's reading. It's writing. And so what matters can also be revealed in what we worship and through the friends we select. Certainly, these distinct observations or ways of knowing are closely related. But I'm going to suggest to you today that they're not exactly the same. Maybe they reveal different parts of us, or even what it means to be who we are, revealing different Ernest Wilsons or different Varun Sonys, depending on the lens that we look through. Call it Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of the soul. Anyway, I thought it would be interesting to see what happens if we tease these issues apart. And so let's begin with logical thinking. Then I'll work through the other three or four things and see what happens. Um, so when I, think about, when I think about what matters to me, it's sort of three big things. Knowledge for its own sake. Goodness for its own sake, and then knowledge and goodness combined together. Knowledge is a pretty straightforward definition. I think goodness is more complicated, and by that I mean being a good person, doing good things, and living in a good society. It matters to the world to try to do good things without expectation of particular consequences to oneself. But goodness to me is also an aesthetic. It matters being around beautiful things, beautiful music, if possible, every day, as uh, Goethe uh, wrote about. Furthermore, linking goodness and knowledge matters not only to individuals, but even more to society at large. But thinking about what matters is not enough, just thinking about it. A wise man once said, quote, we think we think clearly, but that's only because we don't think clearly. Let me repeat that. We think we think clearly, but that's only because we don't think clearly. What about reading and what it reveals? We can deduce what matters from other ways of knowing. And let's face it, in this community, we read a lot. We read a lot. It's what we do. And so what we read probably has something to do with what matters to us. It's probably cause and effect in both directions. 
what we read shapes us, and the, we select readings in part because of how we were shaped. So what we read is a window into what matters to us. Let's narrow this down a little bit. Uh, what books do you keep by your bedside? Let me see a, a show of hand. How many people have a novel, uh, whatever, next to your bedside or close to it? A whole bunch of folks, right? Okay. So maybe that tells us what, you, what matters to you, the books that you keep close to you. You read them for inspiration or solace or distraction after a long day and maybe you know, to bore you enough to fall asleep. But I think the books tell stories about what matters to us. So when I thought about that, I said, OK, well, what do I keep by my bedside? So I started looking. It looks kind of weird. So this is what I keep by my bedside. Um, and I'll let you judge for yourself. Uh, how weird or not weird it is. Um, certainly, you might be a zombie is one that's uh, up there. Uh, the Hole in the Universe by one of my colleagues, Casey Cole. And then there's another slide that's sort of the other. Uh, so there's a bunch of poetry books. The Untethered Soul, which I think you gave me, and I'm on page eight, really happy to know, making progress. Uh, Juno Diaz's work. So take that for what it's worth. but. I think that matters to me because it's the stuff I pull out regularly and read. Um, writing. Writing also reveals what matters to us. Writing is easy for most of us, right? We, you just sit down at a desk, pick up a pen, slit your veins, and bleed all over the paper. It's easy. Uh, so you have to figure that since writing takes so much energy and concentration, and writing is terribly hard, and we have to assume that if we do it, then it probably matters to us because we spend a lot of, of our time doing that or the time we do spend is hard. So that matters to me, and it reveals something fundamental to me. Sometimes I have written what I should not have written, not just because of the content, but because the content could get me in trouble. But back in my pre-tenure days, in other words, before I got guaranteed employment, uh, I wrote stuff that meant a lot of, to me, but probably did not mean much to the tenure committee. And those are the folks who determine whether I you know, got to stay or not as an employee of the university. But it didn't matter to the tenure committee, but it mattered to me. And so I wasted a certain amount of time writing on what matters to me. So again, I did the same thing. I said, you know, what matters to me in books that I write? And so I went to the bookshelf, and I said, well, these are the books that I've either written. I've either written these books or contributed chapters or their articles. And I kind of went through them. And uh, you know, again, it's sort of all over the place, but being uh, interested in meta issues, I did the same thing I did before. I said, what are the categories of the books that are up there? And so it seems to break out into scholarship and societal engagement, inequality and ethnicity, international and comparative studies, especially Africa and China, and African American studies. So that seems to be what matters to me because I've written stuff about them. Um, and one of the essays is uh, entitled, The Flip Side of Metcalfe's Law, Multiple and Growing Costs of Network Exclusion, which I wrote with a, a colleague, uh, Rahul Tongia, who's at Carnegie Mellon. And so this last essay, the recent essay, it's in one of these journals, essentially indicts scholars' exclusion of the excluded in their writing. The famous Metcalfe's law says the value of a network is equal to the square of the number of nodes in the network. But what are the consequences for those who are excluded in our increasingly networked world? Those doomed to remain unconnected. This disutility, in other words, their pain, grows exponentially with the expansion of the network. In other words, if you are excluded from the network, 
as everybody else is getting on board the network, then over time, you're screwed. That's the bottom line. And what I was complaining about is that most scholars tend to look at the benefits of network inclusion and not the costs of network exclusion. That was sort of the, the, the piece. And, and that piece underscores another component of my life and spirit, something that matters a whole hell of a lot to me. My writing and attention goes regularly and lots of energy to the status of those who live at the bottom of society and on the outskirts of society. The bottom of society and the outskirts of society, the periphery. And I write about those who don't have the privilege of those born at the top of their society and at its center. I write a lot about the perspective from the bottom up and the outside in. And the word perspective, I think, is central here. I don't produce lots of detailed empirical data on the conditions of the excluded and exploited. Other scholars do do that. But rather, I look at the exclusionary work done by different perspectives, models, and paradigms. Who gets included and who gets excluded when people write about the world? That seems to be something that matters to me. Not surprisingly, this means a great deal of thinking and writing about and framing about African Americans and other people of color. And I'm going to suggest why that might be uh, further on in, in my uh, talk here. So it seems that the writing category is pretty consistent with the reading category, not so much in the content of each, but in their variability and range. Diversity of expression seems to be something that matters to me. And you'll hear me say that. It's not a false statement, but it has been interesting to me, Varun, to go back and read the stuff that I've written and look for patterns that I hadn't thought about when I was writing them. So when I say, gee, I discovered that I'm interested in this. Who knew? Uh, that's not just a conceit. It really is a rediscovery, in a way, of things that really do matter to me. So then there's another kind of writing. Uh, how many people in this room, again, by a show of hands, have written something that was not required of them a postcard, a note to self, a journal, or a diary. Wow. OK, a lot of people have done that. Um, so I've been doing that a little bit also. Um, you can't see this too well, but this is a, the front page of a diary dated from, I think, 1967. And it says it has my dorm room on it my home address, and then this really corny thing here that says, confidential, do not open. Because you, know, you don't want anybody just reading your diary, right? So I stamp that on it. Um, so that's dated 1967, which if this is 2017, that's uh, longer ago than I'm going to say publicly. But it feels like about 50 years. So in 1963, I started keeping a journal. And I've written in the journal for more than 50 years. So I guess maintaining a journal seems to matter to me. It seems sort of egotistical, since it really, really is all about me. That's what a memoir is. But I've learned a lot from it about history and society, as well as learning about myself. And I urge all of you, if you haven't started yet, start a journal, start a diary. Um, so the journal is a record of what I read as well as what I thought and what I did. And I love it because a journal is a blessing because it allows you to live thrice. You live three times when keeping a journal. And so once you get into the habit of it, you begin to anticipate what you're going to write, and then you write it, and then you go back and you read what you've written at some point. And that begins to feel to me like I'm living three times in anticipation, in the act of writing, and then going back and reading and rereading. So I figured out, I added that up, that makes me 150 years old. And some days it actually feels like 150 years old. Um, but since I've been fortunate enough to have lived an abundant life, which is a sign on a church that's very near campus, it says abundant life, and that just struck me as a 
nice way to frame what one does or aim for. So I have to confess, rereading some of the entries is pretty cool. I flipped through them in preparation for this talk. I read descriptions of lots of lunches with interesting people. Uh, I should be like way overweight because my journal seemed to be filled with d me describing stuff I'm eating, <laughs> you know, meals and so forth. So when I was 16, there were lunches with Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was the Chief Justice of the uh, US Supreme Court, and the US Poet Laureate Stephen Spender at the Library of Congress. At 26, it was lunch and working in Oakland food kitchens with Black Panthers. At 46, with Nelson Mandela at the South African Embassy in Washington. Starting at 60, annual Thanksgiving and Christmas dinners with this guy named Quincy Jones. And at 66, wonderful regular dinners with Norman Lear and Warren Bennis, our very dear friend who passed away just about a year ago. But we would get together on a regular basis, uh, Warren and Bennis and myself. It was great because he was 92 and uh, Warren was 87. I felt like the teenager in the group. But we would get together and talk about what matters to us. I hadn't thought about that, Varun, until preparing for uh, this opportunity. And Norman was writing his autobiography at the same time and working through daddy issues and employment issues and what it means to be Jewish. And, and it was a really, uh, it really was what about, what matters to the three of us and how we can share in that process. Journals also reveal what matters in terms of what you actually do with your time. When we talk about doing, it's all too often about the official things, our jobs, our professional obligations. And I am certainly as careerist as the next type A guy, and probably more so. Um, and so reviewing what I do in my professions and what matters is once again a lot of variety. That's the nice word for it, and another word for it might be ADD, or can't hold down a job, but if I look back at my professional career, I have done a variety of different things over the years. It's sort of been a revolving door between think tanks, government, the academy, companies, and lots of international organizations. And I won't bore you with the details, but let's safe, say it's safe to say that I like to move around and do different things. Some of this I do, and because I'm an intellectual as well as somebody who likes to do stuff, which can be a painful position sometimes, I'll confess, I justify doing things in part by convincing myself that it will better inform my knowing of things, which will then better inform my writing. Now, sometimes that's basically just a ruse, just to trick myself into doing stuff I would do anyway, and I justify it by saying, I'll write a great article, or it'll be a great chapter in a book. But I'm not so sure that's always the case. Sometimes it's just fun and important to do stuff. A word about work at USC in the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Ten years ago, when I was reflecting on whether to leave my hometown of Washington, DC, my family and my childhood friends, I asked myself a, a kind of a meta question. And I gave kind of a meta answer. Actually, it wasn't a meta answer. It was a pretty straightforward answer. Why in the world should I leave what I am doing in Washington, D.C., and go to a place like L.A., of all places? And from my perspective, as a dyed-in-the-wool Northern California Berkeley grad, L.A. was materialist. It wasn't serious. It was fluffy with Hollywood and dangerous with planet-polluting car culture. Now, as the people in this room know, all of that is true, but there are some kind of nice compensations, including opportunities like this one. So I went back to the journals from 2006 and 2007. Uh, did we show, let me see, go, go to the next one. Yeah, so these are the journals. This is 10 years worth of journals of different sizes, different colors, but it's all this journal stuff that I've been doing since 1963. This is the latest version. So before I left DC, according to the journals of that time, I asked myself four questions of what really matters for me to leave DC, which I love, to go to LA that I didn't know and was suspicious of. And so here are the four questions. Is the work important? 
Is it with people I like? Is there money for me and projects that I want to do? And fourthly, is it fun? I suspect everyone in this room over a certain age has done work that is unimportant with people they hate, no money, and it wasn't fun. So I was fortunate enough to reach the point where I said, let me see if I can't try to make these four things work for me since they seem to matter. Happily, almost every day of the past decade I have been dean, these four things that matter most to me have been realized at the Annenberg School. I confess that at least one of them I experience every day. Not all of them every day, nor all day of every day, but there are lots of full four days when it's fun with people I like, there's you know, programs, it's, and the work is important. And that, I think, is a, is a blessing. In thinking about doing as a means to reveal what really matters and how you make it matter, I think about my boss, Max Nikias. At one point several years ago, he instructed all the deans, we were at a meeting with him at 9 o'clock in the morning, to spend 70% of our time doing one thing. And what would that one thing be? Raising money. Raising money. Um, so it took me at least a year to understand what that meant. It took me a year to understand that intention and action in any area of life are tied to your calendar. When you deem something truly important, that's what you write into every day's schedule. The important stuff, the ma things that matter, must be ruthlessly managed and owned. The rest must be ruthlessly dismissed. That extends to life beyond fundraising. We must be mindful of the time we spend doing what we do because it goes very quickly and we don't want to look back and say, hey, I wasted all this time doing X, but I say that what really matters to me is Y. And a lot of that support has come through the Annenberg family, Wallace Annenberg, uh, when I first took the job, said, well, what are you going to do that's interesting and new? And without friends to push us in the direction and employees uh, and employers and supporters, it's easy to lose our way. There is a saying that we all love our children, but we don't all like our children. I have been blessed to love and really like my two sons and really appreciate and adore and wonder at our comradeship and companionship. They are really smart, they read voraciously, and they're really funny, and I like doing stuff with my two sons, including talking about this talk. And they gave me some pretty good advice about what I, they, they, all those bad words, they said, Dad, you should probably take, take that out. So I did. Uh, and the same is true for my wonderful wife, who is also a professor here and also has spoken at this forum. Uh, we are in love and we are constantly in conversations about everything in the world. These amazing people matter to me. So here's a question. Why do these things matter? You know, the reading, the writing, the doing. Why, why do they matter? So I'm going to wrestle with that for a minute and try to be as honest as possible. So during one of our dinners when I was trying to describe a crazy screenplay idea to Norman, um, in which I somehow linked up the origins of the universe and dark energy and dark matter with Hindu cosmology as seen through the eyes of a South Asian graduate student at Stanford. I mean, how boring is that? <laughs> but uh, Norman said incredulously, Say, how in the world did you end up with that idea and we're having this conversation over dinner? You know, what's, what's with that? He said, oh, that's a good question. And so I, that, again, discovered that in, in, in my journal. And so for me, it's the usual catechism of parents, extended family, societal context, timing, and early experiences. That's what made me think about what matters to me. The shorthand version is to refer back to my conceit of my empathy for, with those who live at the bottom of society and are forced to inhabit the social 
periphery. Remember, I had said that earlier. The bottom of society and the outside of society. Because that's where I grew up. Roughly in the same universe in which other black people of my generation grew up, at the bottom of society and at the periphery. But truth be told, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up at the top of the bottom and the most central part of the periphery, which is actually a pretty interesting place to be. It's not the very top, but it's the top of the bottom. It's not at the center, but it's sort of at the center of the periphery. And that has probably shaped a great deal of what matters to me. So growing up in a segregated southern town, I was subject to the same racial slurs and insults that American apartheid imposed on all its darker citizens. When I was a kid, I didn't know why my parents never shopped downtown in Washington, DC, because it was segregated, and why I had to pee in a jar on Route 66 when we drove up to see my grandparents in Philadelphia, because there were segregated gas stations. I didn't notice uh, very much when, after we moved out of what used to be called the ghetto, we started shopping at Goodwill, because stuff was cheaper there. And we didn't have the money to spend as we had before. Later, I had the nasty baptism that many of my generation have of being called a nigger. And I learned to pay close attention when my father told me exactly how to behave when the police stopped me for nothing. The same lessons that I, as a black father, with equal part sadness and profound bitterness, had to painfully teach my own two sons, since to me, their black lives matter more than life itself. But mostly, even under segregation in the 60s, my life was good. I grew up on a black college campus filled with knowledge and goodness. Almost everybody in the family went to one college or another, including Howard University, Lincoln, Harvard, University of Chicago. Most of them were professionals, a judge here, a chemist there, a Broadway choreographer, a social worker, college administrator, teacher. And so role models matter. And it mattered a lot to me that there were lots of writers in my family, from my dad, whose poetry was published by Langston Hughes, to my great-grandfather, who wrote a biography of a family friend whose name was Frederick Douglass. In, in matters, or it matters, that I was warmly and comfortably ensconced in DC black society, filled with deep affirmations, comfort, and self-confidence, complete with picnics in Rock Creek Park, cotillions and dance lessons, I can't believe that, but it was true, um, and an all-black beach house community on Chesapeake Bay. There were, these were treasures and gifts of the heart and the soul. And I learned to love being outside and knowing, personally, the bottom of society. And as my mother and father constantly reminded me and modeled in their behaviors, everybody has a story to tell. Everybody has a story to tell, from the inside and outside, from the bottom and the top. They insisted to my siblings, to my neighboring friends, to others, that we had unique stories to tell, and we had a unique life to live. But we were also told, we expect you to be the best. You will be twice as good as the white folks, even if you get half as much. You will be the first. We heard this again and again as the off-spoken, unambiguous demand from our community. It's what Nina Simone, Nina Simone sang about in her song, Young, Gifted, and Black. Black lives matter, not just when they are under attack and threatened with death, but when, thr when thriving and promised the world. So the, beyond the benefits of a tightly knit, segregated community, I also benefited from attending a small, uh, all-white elite school on Capitol Hill. There's the lone black kid in the whole school uh, for some of the years I was there. Uh, and I learned a, lo a lot about what Southern segregationists say to one another when they send their kids to school. But, uh, and that was interesting. I learned a lot, and it's also learned a lot by partying for days nonstop 
on, at great black tie parties on Embassy Row on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, D.C., especially with the daughters of the Iranian ambassador and the sons of Ambassador al sawayel who was from Saudi Arabia, as well as friends from Nigeria and Niger and France and England. So that mattered. It taught me how the world operates in different contexts. And since it was still a racist society, it mattered that on the night Martin Luther King was killed in 1968, I stayed the night in the tear-gassed headquarters of the SNCC, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee headquarters at 14th and Florida Avenue in Washington as half of the city burned and the flames illuminated the sky. It matters that I marched against the Vietnam War. It matters a lot to me that as a black nationalist student, I helped create the Afro-American Studies program at Harvard University to push back perspectives, uh, to push black perspectives into a thoroughly white dominated institution. So all of these unlikely kaleidoscopish experiences leveraged me into the unusual position of living a life that afforded privileged access and glimpses of all angles of American society, from top to bottom, inside to outside. It taught me, in some ways, the skills of the amphibian. Let me bring this to a close by pointing to the future. And so what matters next? And so given what I've said about what matters to me so far, what would you say would be the next step in this implausible, predictable journey? Um, some of it has been uh, foreshadowed by my colleague um, working on this idea of what I call third space. And the third space grew out of conversations I had with about 100 executives around the country asking them what matters to them. I hadn't put it in those terms, but uh, commercially, uh, what matters to you, I ask people at IBM and Facebook um, and auto companies and banks, what matters to you in the world? And they said there are these skills, soft skills, not the technology skills, but soft skills. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. Four years in the crafting, my team and I have already made this new way of thinking available to more than 300 students. So this is called the third space. It's called the third space because it's not the space of engineering, which is really important. It's not the th space of business, which is also important. It's a distinctive third space that so far doesn't exist, and I intend to create. So, so far, we've made third space thinking available to more than 300 USC students, scores of working class Latino and black high school students from South Central LA, dozens of corporate executives, and 100 senior officials in the government of the People's Republic of China on these kinds of issues, empathy, cultural competence, adaptability. Turns out they're universally desired and universally in short supply. Now, one of the things that happened, especially in talking to the people in China and to the people in the corporations, they said bluntly, especially after, if we were having Cabernet Sauvignon after dinner, they said, uh, Dean, you'd be a total idiot if you don't do this for the rest of your life. This is so important. You ought to stop doing other things and do this third space thing. And after I heard that about 10 times, I said, maybe I should give that serious consideration. So I've told the provost and the president that I decided to pursue my passion, doing, thinking, reading, and writing about this critical work, and to step down from the deanship in order to set up uh, what I call the USC Annenberg Center for Third Space Thinking. So the day after tomorrow, this is pretty cool, the day after tomorrow, I travel to the White House and the National Academy of Engineering with Dean Yanis Yortsotz of the Engineering School to advocate for this third space approach to framing and acting upon the world's grand challenges. But this is curious in a way. A serious research team interviews hundreds of people on what matters to them now and in the digital future, only to reveal attributes that have mattered to me for the last 50 years. It's kind of weird. Maybe it's karma. Maybe it's luck. 
I mean, are these genuine, essential attributes of our times, or simply tales that I wanted to hear all along when I interviewed people? Maybe recrafted a little bit to fit my own personal narrative, mere artifacts of the storyteller. Well, time will tell, ladies and gentlemen, time will tell. Anyway, it feels a lot like goodness and necessary knowledge applied to purposeful action, which matters to me, however one gets to that outcome. I think it's a new methodology relevant to the top and to the bottom, to insiders and outsiders, to women and to men, to the academy and to the real world. It feels like something that matters to me, and I want to pursue that for the foreseeable future. I, sort of feel, I tell my friends I feel like a teenager again to be this excited uh, at this stage in my life for something that is so important. So my final reflection, we are what we eat, a wise person once said, and I suggest that we are also what we read and what we write and what we do. All of them express in some ineffable way who we are as a unique spiritual, ethical, and social being. It's a matter of being human. And how do reading and writing and doing fit together, which is more important? I don't know, but I do hope that these questions have provoked in you a way of thinking about what matters to you. Thank you very much. I've gone on a little bit longer than I anticipated, but that's an occupational hazard with professors, I think. Yeah, so one or two questions, if anybody has. Yes, sir, Bob Paget, who I'm so delighted joined us today. He's my, he's my boss's boss's boss, by the way. Well, thank you so much for that. But thank you for a very interesting presentation. And I, I congratulate you on, on your about to become Endeavor. And, and the fact that you were listening to Earl Warren when you were 16 years old is staggering. A uh, question about your building, which, of course, is very important to you. Since I found it interesting that Les Moonves said that uh, it had elements to it that they did not have at CBS. Where did you go, where did your designers go, your systems designers go to, to bring in all the incredible elements that it possesses? It's a great question, Bob, and it is, what we did was to figure out what matters to us. I mean, that's really the bottom line. And in anticipate, we hadn't invented third space yet, but it was some of this thinking. So the way we started, I think most of you have seen the new building that's down here. Um, we took a year to talk to ourselves about what matters to us. We talked to faculty, we talked to students, we talked to staff, we talked to Wallace Annenberg, our donor, and the, the consensus was we want something open. We want spaces that are not containers but connectors. We want spaces where people come from the engineering school and the journalism school and they sit together and they collaborate and do cool things. And so we, we spent so much time talking about that that the, the architect of the Central University said, enough already with the communication, just build the damn building. Uh, but when we finally built the damn building, it was a result of what we wanted. And then we went to the BBC, we went to the Wall Street Journal, we went to NPR, all around the country, around the world, looking at buildings that were sort of like ours, including the Kennedy School at Harvard, which has a big old forum in the middle of it. And Bob, the, the most wonderful part about that, the way I say it, is that we had conversations amongst ourselves, me and my colleagues, and then we had a conversation with the architects. The architects built a building that reflected our conversation, and then the building started talking. The building started communicating. The build started moving people into groups. The building started cre you know, creating conversations in places under the stairs and in the back and places that you could sort of get together and collaborate. So that's the, the, the you, you put your finger on something very important is the building matters a lot. Not just as the building, but because the physical architecture creates the human architecture that talks back and forth. Other criticisms, suggestions for other? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was wondering if you had any interest in 
Yeah, do it, say it into the mic so we can record it for posterity. Okay, I'm LaTanya Seal of the MBA Career Services at Marshall, right at Popovich Hall. Thank you so much for being here today. Sure. My question to you is, are you going to turn all those journals into your memoirs, and when will the book be published? Ah, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Well, the, the, first, I have to write this third space book, but that, I hope, is only going to be about 120 pages, and I hope to do that while I'm on sabbatical. But yeah, I mean, it's um, one of the great gifts that my elder son gave to me was he went into Kensington, Maryland, where I have a storage shed. And the other, you know, 40 years of journals are there. And he took an iPad and he photographed every page. So there are 10,000 images. So there it is. And so I'm, the easiest thing to do for me would just be to publish the damn things, cross out the bad words and evil thoughts, uh, and then just do, you know, put it up on a website. Or, I, I haven't thought about that. More work is probably more fun and more important, which is to make it a memoir rather than just a collection of stuff. Um, and, and quite frankly, one of the reasons I was so delighted when Dean Sony uh, asked me to do this is because it would push me to think about the question that you raised. And so I'll be eternally damning him <laughs> for making me sit down and work this hard, uh, and probably the hard work that I will do in the future. Let me just say, yeah, yes, sir. So no, 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 go ahead. Okay. So you've identified these five somewhat soft skills. Yes, sir. How are you going about creating a curriculum uh, for these yeah. things that are somewhat almost innate qualities? Absolutely. It is like teaching art. And um, how many of you have had an art class in your life? How many of you are famous world-class painters or artists? How many of you think you learned something really beneficial from those art classes? Um, but practically what we're doing, I'm working with a guy named Chris Swain and others. So we've offered about eight to nine classes already in various aspects of this. And what we're really wrestling with, it's a great question, is how do you teach empathy? How do you teach adaptability? Well, it turns out, as with anything else, there is a vast literature on each of those topics. How is it expressed in institutions? How is it expressed at the individual level? Through psychological lenses, through sociological lenses. So, I didn't have confidence at the beginning we could teach that, but we've taught it. I have two data points. Uh, when I taught this a class with this stuff last year, a bunch of the students came up afterwards as we were heading toward the end of the class, and they said, we think this third space thing is really cool. Could you teach it some more, like, you know, in this class? I said, well, the class is over next week. He said, we don't, we'd like to stay with you and your colleague and learn more about it. I said, but you won't get any credit for it. I won't get paid for it. It'll be another five weeks. And they, and they went away, and they came back and said, it's a deal. <laughs> so that's probably the high point of my life when 20 students said, yeah, we'll take a course with you on third space stuff, and we don't care if we get credit or not. The other thing that happened far, far away, in a universe far, far away, is that we gave a similar course to 40 really senior, mostly male members of the Communist Party of China who were very senior government officials. And so we ran through this stuff and we were talking about South China Sea, we were talking about the Silk Road, we were talking about really gnarly, very difficult issues. And I didn't know if they were gonna throw us in jail or declare us persona non grata. At the end of the session, at the end of the session, me and my five other colleagues from the Annenberg School for Communication, we were standing there waiting to see what these very senior people would say. They stood up, and I've done this a lot of, this kind of stuff a lot, they stood up, they gave us a standing ovation, and they sang us a song. Please come back to China and teach us more about third space thinking. I mean, it wasn't quite that, but it was really sort of that. So the, the, the final thing I want to say is that 
I would like to suggest that in terms of what matters to me, I don't know if he's done it yet, but Dean Varun Sony would be a great candidate to give a talk on what matters to me and why. Have you done that yet, Varun? Oh, great, so we got him on the spot. Because um, I think you know, his, his life really does exemplify a lot of these things and uh, a lot of what matters, I think, to many of us. So I want to thank him, and I especially want to thank all of you for coming out and joining in this conversation with me this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Uh, please join me in thanking, once again, Dean Ernest Wilson for a really provocative, engaging, profound talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really wonderful. And, um, and that was one of the deepest talks I've ever heard anywhere. So thank, well, thank you, you so much for the care time, and too. thought you put into it. And on behalf of the student committee, I want to present you thank with you. a journal for oh, your memory. Oh, good. <laughs> We've been doing this for nine years. Let, 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 let me start. <laughs> so you can start with that. Thank so. you, sir. Thanks again for joining us. Please join us next month for Scott Soames and fight on.